I'm Richard S. George, a retired Air Force Colonel who has been in the military, Air Force, U.S. Air Force, for 32 years prior to retirement. I was born in Austin, Texas in 1922. I attended all school years up through two years of college at the University of Texas and in the Austin school system. And then I went off to the war. Uh, After completing overseas training at uh, El Paso, Biggs, we were shipped to England. And I was assigned to the 452nd Bombardment Group, the 731st Bomb Squadron. And this would have been in January of 45. So I was a little startled though at the, at the end briefing when I was, there were four crews of us. It was my crew, a crew, they see the bishop, and I don't recall the names of the other two crews. But the briefer said, well, this is this and that and that, and then we fly here and we fly there. And said, oh, by the way, losses are down to only 25% now. 25%? There's four crews. 25% is one of these crews. Not me. I'm not, I'm not going to be in that statistic. I don't want to do that. Well, unfortunately, the one named Bishop did become the statistic. And, a very sad body. He was a heck of a nice guy. He went down in the North Sea. He was flying a number four slot, and I was in the number two. And the lead, uh, he flew up into the lead. He got vertigo, I guess, and pulled up into the tail. And the lead's tail hit him right in the cockpit and probably killed him right there. And then they spun down in the North Sea. The lead returned to, I think it was Green Common or somewhere. I forgot the name of the emergency landing field, which was on the coast of England. And so then I had to take the lead of the particular squadron. But after we got kind of adjusted around, uh, golly, everything's, you're scared to death, of course, and you're, Pucker strings pretty high. That'll, that'll take some of the take some of the pressure off. So I say, well, we got it made from here on. Our 25 percent's gone. But that's kind of fallacious thinking. But that's it helped a little bit for a while. So they sent me out of there, and they sent me to Carswell Air Force Base, Fort Worth, Texas. And that was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. We were equipped with B-36s. When, when I was down in the AIO, which I accepted reluctantly for a while, I was flying Goonie Birds, C-47. I kept telling them I want to get down to the B-36. Gosh, I never saw such a big machine in my life. So in 1952, they said, all right, get out of our hair, go on down there. Now the B-36, was that was about eight years or seven years of some of the most interesting flying. We, I believe the B-36 kept us out of war for a certainty. Uh, but if you look at the airplane, it's, it's like looking at a huge mountain. You're awed by its expanse and mammothness, if that's a word. Because a B-36 has got a wingspan of 230 feet. And it's about 167 feet long. Which means if you set it on a football field, with the fuselage running across the field, it would have it would exceed the width of the field. The wings would reach to about the 12 yard line. And to give you a little more perspective on its size, 
The Wright brothers' first flight was from one wing tip to the fuselage in length. Pretty big airplane. It's six pusher type engines. And then they decided, well, we were, I think that when it was originally built, it only had a service ceiling about 35,000 feet. We need to go higher than that. So they took jet pods off of a B-47 and hung a jet pod on near each wing tip with two jets apiece in them. So we ended up with 10 engines, four jets and six reciprocating engines. It was often referred to as we had six of turning and four of burning. It, it had a lot of power when we got that, and which allowed us to fly up as high as uh, we, I have flown cell, which was our style of formation at that time, at 48,000 feet. And you used all of the engines to keep up there. I know of tests that were run with the airplane where the altitude far exceeded that. I might point out that the, the 4360 engines, which were on it, right, Pat, I mean, Pratt Whitney, and uh, they were also used on, uh, I think, the C-97, but they leaked very badly. There, there was plenty of oil that was used. As a matter of fact, figuring the leakage and the consumption, each reciprocating engines, that's six of them. Each of them had a oil barrel of 140 gallons. Well, 140 gallons is unheard of as far as oil for any kind of engine, except the B-36. And I have run out of oil, but I've also seen spots on the runway or the taxiway or ramp, <coughs> huge spots of oil. The tanks in the wing, the wings were, uh, had the tanks, of course, and they leaked from time to time. Early on, they had trouble getting them to stop leaking. And I have, in the earlier days, say around 52, seen a barrel sitting under a wing catching the gasoline falling out of it. So it was a, could be a hazardous thing, but I think it was one of the, you could fly that airplane with more wrong with it than anyone I ever flew.